Hi, my name is Kevin.com Brown, and you are watching Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Jill Geisler, who heads the leadership and management programs of the Pointer Institute. She's also a popular podcaster on iTunes U and the author of a new book, Work Happy, What Great Bosses Know. Stick around. Her skills will be put to the test trying to manage this interview and me. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of unruly local TV journalists who know it all but only have 30 seconds and perfect hair and teeth to explain it to you, the home viewer, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I was a crappy office manager. I had my shot back in 1988 as managing editor of Tampa Bay Weekly. The alternative newspaper had just been sold, and I made a pretty good pitch to the new publisher to step in as editor. Now, in terms of understanding the market and the nature of content the audience would enjoy, I think I had a pretty good handle on that. In terms of managing everyone from the production and editorial side to the advertising and circulation staff, eh, not so much. I had zero experience leading and inspiring others. I was extremely socially awkward, although I had managed to get engaged and was in the midst of planning a May wedding. Little, thi little things could easily set me off still, and I didn't see the big picture, the long game, and all those other management cliches. My boss, the publisher, was based in Minneapolis and only parachuted in once a month, leaving the ad director and I in charge. He offered good advice and direction when he was in town, but we were otherwise on our own. And the ad director and I didn't get along. That relationship went to hell when the publisher decided he needed one of the only two private offices for himself, even though he was rarely around, and forced us to share a small space. The ad director wanted the door closed at all times because she was on the phone romancing advertisers. I wanted it open so I was accessible to the staff. And it was, all a, it was all moot a few months later when Creative Loafing came to town from Atlanta and crushed us. Now, in the years since, I have co-authored a number of business and management books. Shockingly, I've made a good living from that work, which is why I had a personal interest in Jill Geisler's new book, Work Happy, What Great Bosses Know. The book is drawn from her 20 years of experience running a TV newsroom, starting, somewhat ironically, at the same age I was when I blew my shot in print management. The difference is that Jill was really, really good at it. Since leaving the newsroom, Jill has been on the teaching staff of the Pointer Institute here in St. Petersburg, where she focuses on leadership and management. She also hosts an incredibly popular podcast heard on Pointer Online and iTunes U called What Great Bosses Know. And because of the Pointer connection, and its promotion of stuff like, you know, ethics, I will point out that I have done work for Pointer over many years, although I don't think that Jill and I have actually worked together before. Oh, and one more thing, we're both represented by the same agent, the fabulous Jane Distel. Jill Geisler, thanks for putting up with that long introduction, and welcome to Mr. Media. Oh, well, leadership is all about telling stories, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I got a million of them. <laughs> So, Jill, I mean, you, you've obviously become the expert on good management practices and techniques, and we'll get to the good stuff in a minute, but what are some of the worst practices that you've seen and experienced, uh, you know, over the years? I think that there are some trust-busting practices that, that bad bosses exhibit. Um, they take credit for other people's work. They refuse to take blame or they shift it to others. Uh, they're one person in front of their staff and another person when someone in an upper level management is around. You know, I'm not talking about people who are disorganized. There are some great bosses who aren't very well organized. And I'm not talking about people who are, oh, perhaps short-tempered, although I think we'd like to have bosses who are mellow. I'm talking about people who are a step worse than that. 
about people who are aware that they have these problems, including a short temper, a really short fuse, but don't do something about it, don't try to manage it, or people who don't think that it's important to build a culture in an organization, but they basically just let whatever's going to happen happen depending on their whim of the day. So they lack the ability to build a culture, to build trust, and to build teams. They're all about the work, and people are just a means to an end. Of course, the good thing about those people is they keep you in business. <laughs> well, they, they do, or they cause people to realize that what made you good as an employee, made you very good, doesn't necessarily make you good as a boss. And that's why there are some people who are brilliant employees who shouldn't be promoted to management. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's about finding people who really want to adapt that new skill set. I know in my case, I had to have that experience of, of managing people to realize that what I was really good at was working by myself at home in the house with a couple of dogs around. Um, and to be very proud of that because you do good work then. Well, you know, hopefully. You, and you <laughs> certainly work harder. Um, what was the – another question along the same line though. Now, what was the worst advice you ever got in your career about managing? And how did you find out that it was really bad advice? Wow, that's a good question. You know, I tend to remember the best advice that I gave, that I received, um, and usually it was because I was giving myself bad advice. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. When I was an er, just a ba I call a baby manager when I was brand new, um, it was an unfortunate situation, and we were not going to be renewing someone's contract. And in the course, and I was brand new, and my two major bosses in the station were with me. And in that difficult conversation, and it was a difficult conversation to tell someone that their employment wasn't going to continue, this person reacted in a very volatile way and turned it on me and said, my problem is my standards aren't high enough for this place. Now, as a youngster in management, I thought my job was to defend my turf, especially in front of my two bosses. And so my reaction was, oh, yeah? Well, what about this and this and this and this? And went on pretty much of a tear thinking, boy, are they going to be proud of me. And when it was all over, and it was longer because of my extending it, they both looked at me and said, you didn't need to do that. You didn't need to do that. And what I didn't realize then, I thought that bosses had to hold their ground. If someone it said anything to impugn your integrity, you had to dig in for a fight. I've only later come to realize that at the end of the day, you're still the boss. This person was hurt and angry and was going to say something negative. And I had to have the confidence in my own leadership to withstand that onslaught and just say, I'm sorry you feel that way. We'll take the next step now. And we're going to come to the good practices soon, but I'm, I'm, I'm always somewhat more interested in, in kind of the, the, the bad side because, of course, we tend sure. to learn more from that side. Um, why do the people who fail as managers, as I did, uh, admittedly, what, why do most of them f that, that fail, why do they fail? What, what, are the, you know, what are the pitfalls? Where are the traps, the trap doors? One of, one of the traps is that they keep doing their old work. Um, when we're promoted, first of all, you need to understand that one of the key intrinsic motivators that keeps us all going is a sense of confidence. I want to do more of what I'm good at. You know, you think about it, if you played a musical instrument, when you first had to practice, you hated it, you'd have to be dragged to it because it just wasn't good. But the moment that you transition into being good at it, practice wasn't work anymore. Practice was fun. You would do it because you wanted to. No one had to order you to play the piano. You ordered yourself. That's intrinsic motivation. All right, so I'm competent. I'm a competent writer, or I'm a competent salesperson, or a marketer, or a designer. I'm put in charge of others. So what do I do? Instead of helping them do their best work, I keep doing that work. I take it out of their hands. I redo it. I tell them what's wrong. I don't look at the big picture. I don't look to see what's coming up. I'm constantly reacting to things, and I'm down in the weeds looking at things that other people should be tending to. That's one of the ways that bosses can fail. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that was something that I, I definitely had to learn. And I, you know, sometimes I wish that I had the, the opportunity for that experience again now where I'm a little more mature, I've mellowed, I've seen a lot. 
you know, there's a lot to be said for when they say, you know, like uh, they, writers talk about, I think, a lot. You know, I, I can't, I couldn't write about things at a certain age because I hadn't experienced anything. You have, you have to really, you, I mean, it's a rare person, I think, who can, who can uh, break that. Uh, I always say I teach from my mistakes so that other managers don't have to. And I made a lot of really silly mistakes. The fact that you build every day, you try to build social capital with people so that when you do make a mistake, they'll forgive you. And one of the ways you build social capital is the way in which you respond to mistakes yourself. In the book, I talk about a couple of responses. You know, there are the, the bosses who are explainers. And there are the bosses who are exploders, and there are the bosses who are explorers. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a boss who is routinely an exploder because of a mistake, a couple of things are going to happen. People aren't going to come to you to tell you that something's about to go wrong because you've made it clear that they're going to be punished no matter what. If you're an explainer, well, those are the bosses who too often just spend their time telling their own bosses, well, you know, we didn't have the right stuff and we didn't get enough warning, and it sounds too much like they're not taking it seriously. But the explorer is the boss who I think really handles mistakes well. It doesn't mean you shouldn't show that you're upset, especially if bad decision making, and certainly if unethical decision making is involved, we got a serious thing to talk about. But Explorers are the people who essentially say, Bob, all right, this didn't go the way we wanted it to. Let's talk about why it happened. Let's talk about what we're going to do to change it so that when we leave here, we will have an agreement and a commitment as to why it will not happen again. And I will tell you that that approach, that explorer approach, will cause people to come to you and say, yo, Bob, I got to tell you, uh, something just fell apart here, and I'm going to tell you it's probably my doing, and I want you to be aware of it. Well, what happens? You cut off mistakes at the pass, and you have people who are much more forthright about talking to you early if something appears to be going wrong. And they'll make fewer mistakes if you do it. If you really explore, you will look at the systemic reason for a mistake. Well, what led to this bad decision? Not who do I blame and who do I kick in the butt, I'm not saying every now and then you might have to kick somebody in the butt. But, but if people know that your bigger interest is in keeping mistakes from happening in the future, not extracting blood from people who committed them, and you're going to eliminate, not eliminate, we never eliminate, but we're going to reduce errors. Uh, tell folks uh, who are fans of either the column or the podcast uh, what they're going to find in this book that will be familiar and what, what they'll find that will be new to them. Mm. Well, what I've been told by people is that what they like about the podcast and the columns is that they feel like I'm talking to them. And they feel like I'm tapping them on the shoulder at a time that they need it with short bits of information that are immediately useful. That's the part that I try to shift over to the book. Um, the, the people who've had advanced looks at it have told me, I feel like you're talking to me. I hear your voice. And that and that's, makes me happy because I want it to really be not preachy. Um, interestingly, because I work with journalists first and foremost, although now I work with managers of all kinds, but because of our background in working with journalists, I believe that everything I teach about has to have some foundation in research that they could look up and check. There are wonderful parable books out there, you know, Who Moved My Cheese, which sold a bazillion books. I know that there are a lot of managers who don't want to be equated to mice and told parables. They want, if I tell them, here's what you need to know about change management, and here's the research you can look up to back up what I'm saying about what works and what doesn't, they'd be able to do that. So what's in these, probably um, easier for people to see, is a list of all the research that's behind it that I cite. Um, and then there's just a lot of new information. Um, for example, the chapter on feedback. Um, at the same time that I was writing the book, I was asked by one major organization to come in and help them develop an entire focused program on feedback, especially feedback in a diverse workforce. And so I really drilled down on developing new material about breaking feedback into its tiniest parts. You know, there are some bosses, in fact, most bosses believe, well, there are two kinds of feedback. There's praise and there's criticism. And then they say, and I don't praise people for doing what they're supposed to do. You got to do something really good in order to get my praise. Well, I can demonstrate in that chapter 
that well before you get to praise, there's other kinds of feedback, which is tied to motivation. Simply letting people know you see what they're doing, simply giving them an update on what's going on, all of those things are seen as positive feedback. There's reinforcing feedback all the way up to praise, and then at the highest level, celebration. But too many people skip some of those steps. Or they think they're giving praise, and then they erase it at the same time they're giving it. Let, let me give you some praise and erase it at the same time. Okay, Bob? Yeah, all right. sure. I get that all the time. <laughs> oh, hey, I really like the Mr. Media, Mr. Media podcasts and videos, but I think the lead-ins are too long. <laughs> now, yes. Now, the minute I said the word but... I erased everything that came before it. Did you even remember anything that I said? Every no. Word. You heard everything after the word but. Yeah. And it hurts. So does that mean you never couple praise and criticism? No, but there are lots of ways that you can do it. Let's say I didn't have a lot of time to decouple them. Mm. I might say to you, Bob, I really like the Mr. Media programs. Let me tell you what I specifically like. I love the fact that you put a little bit of your human experience into it. You're not just an automaton. I think people get to know you. That's good. I like the fact that you're casual and you even wear headphones so you're not trying to be some kind of polished superstar. I think that's really of new media. And you know, in the future, I think people might get into them even faster and stick with them if you had a shorter lead-in. So all of it would then have a higher impact. Now what's happened? I've demonstrated that I've watched what you do. Mm -hmm. I've got credibility because I'm specific. I hope I'm sincere. And then when I do add something, I, I use the word and instead of but, and I orient it toward the future, toward a positive outcome that I think we both share. It's a little different than nice job, but. <laughs> no, that was good. And I was reminded that at the top of the show, at the very first se second line of the show, I think I, I challenged that you would be challenged to manage the show and me, and I think you did a wonderful job of that. <laughs> that was good. When you, uh, I was laughing too when you said about the, uh, uh, about the intros being too long. I was thinking, oh my god, I hear my wife's voice suddenly through the headphones. <laughs> that's what that's what I always hear when I when the introductions yes. go a little long. But yeah, I mean it. It's all in how you in all in all in how you do it. I I went through this yesterday. I have a a friend who's a former uh, 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 artist, a newspaper artist. And he wants to do a uh, a comic strip, and so he asked me to go and take a look at it. And uh, I, I wanted to, you know, he wanted constructive criticism, or at least he said he wanted. And uh, it was interesting because the f the first page of the website has this wonderful picture of him reclining on a couch, and uh, it's very well drawn. It's extremely well drawn. And then you click through to see the the strip examples, and um, they're not as good as the first picture. They're very simple. They're very underdrawn. They're under detailed. And I just said to him, you know, uh, I said, I, I, the humor is there. I said, I think you need to work on some character development. But, but um, you know, if you're going to show people this wonderful ability you have to sketch up front, you're going to have to live up to it on the next page or lose the first page, nice. lower the bar. So... Mm -hmm. Fortunately, he took that well. But yeah, it is, you know, it's, it's with this hand you, you give and with this hand you take. Well, I, I just finished writing a column that's going to be on Pointer uh, probably by the time you've finished producing this. Um, but it's about the power of good intentions. And it's interesting because even tough criticism, I mean, there are people, literally, there are people I have fired who have now come back to me later and, and, and they're my friends on Facebook. Now, how did that happen? Well, something about the understanding when that happened. These people perhaps weren't fired for cause. They were, I'm talking about, you know, um, inappropriate behavior or something like that. It turned out that they weren't at the level of performance in their young lives that they needed to be despite all of our best efforts and that it was better for them to go for a while to a different location and work. Well, I still have some of those people who come back to talk to me. Now, what is that about? Or to friend me on Facebook. Now, what's that about? I think it's because if you do something, even as difficult as that, but even as minor as everyday corrections or expressions of concern, if people know that in the main you have their best, their best interests at heart, they're going to hear it and feel it differently. I cite a study that was just done by the University of Maryland that was published uh, at the beginning of this year. 
and it's called The Power of Good Intentions. And the psychology professor who did it, Professor Gray, took subjects and gave them candy, massages, and electric shocks in a variety of scenarios. In some of the scenarios, they were administered indifferently, and in others, they were administered by a person who apparently had good intentions. For example, the shocks were, oh, I did that because it would, it, you'd win some money. Okay? These were identical candies, massages, and shocks. In the massage case, instead of the chair starting automatically, a person said, oh, I think you, know, you could use a massage and turned it on. That's all. Candy had a little nice note. The other one didn't. Then all of the people testing all of these different items, all the same, different circumstances, rated them. And they rated the candy tasting better and sweeter, the massages felt better, and the shocks hurt less when delivered by a person who apparently had good intentions. Now, we've talked about the emotional thing. You know, if, if I'm coming to you to say, um, Bob, when you crack your knuckles, um, it really distracts me from my work. And I know you wouldn't want to do that, and I hate hurting your feelings. So I just want to tell you that, because if it's, if it's affecting me, it might affect other people, and I don't know if other people are good enough friends to tell you. And I don't want anybody to not want to sit next to you. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm giving you all of that, all of those good intentions that I mean them, you are going to be less apt to say, holy cow, what's that all about? Nitpicky, or, you know, she doesn't like me, or I get, I'm getting picked on. All of those things change in the perception of positive intentions. But who would have imagined that people would feel a shock less painfully? And the lesson that the researcher said was, think about it for doctors in bedside manner. You know, think about it when you have to deliver bad news to people. How, if you think, well, just get it over with and get out of here is the best thing. Well, maybe not. Mm. And in the book, I also cite some other research about what's called process fairness. And that's the idea that I might not like the outcome of something. I might not like your decision. I may hate and detest the fact that this company laid people off. But the degree to which I sulk or I lower my performance or I exact some kind of retribution from you, even if it's uh, taking a few extra pens home from work, um, is really built on how you handled it, whether I thought the process was fair. Whether somebody came in front of us all and said, this is not what we wanted, and we know it's going to, to really hurt good people, and I'm going to ignore that phone just for you, and it's really going to, to cause extra work for the rest of you, and we thought it through, here was our process, and by the way, people in management are going to be listening to you for the next few days as you give them feedback about how we move forward. Mm -hmm. That as opposed to, here's a memo saying, I'm sorry we had to do this, we had, some, um, we, we had to right size or shrink to grow or all of those business buzzwords. And instead, those people are going, I hate this place. I don't like my bosses. I don't like what we stand for. Because at the end of the day, it's really about your immediate relationship with your boss. There are a lot of people today who aren't at all fond of their own company but they really do like their bosses mm -hmm. because of the relationship the boss has established and because basically the boss operates in their best interest. I wanted to ask you, uh, you make some references to the 360-degree uh, review process yeah. that a lot yep. of companies use. I, 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 I first encountered that uh, working on a book with the founders of the Home Depot years ago, and mm -hmm. they, were, they had just started it uh, in that year or two preceding, and they were very... Uh, involved in it and very fascinated with it, but it also ate up an awful lot of uh, company time and energy. I, I was just kind of curious uh, what you feel about the pros and cons of that, if you're comfortable mm. discussing it. Absolutely. Um, 360 feedback has, degree feedback is, has pros and cons, and it, it is all about the way to do it right. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you don't use it, 360 feedback I should define is um, I'm, I'm the person who's getting the feedback. I select um, a number of employees. In some cases, the companies pre-select them for you, um, but often you select uh, peers, your bosses, and other um, direct reports, let's say if you're a manager, people who report to you, 
to give you feedback on specific things that, that are expected of you as a boss. We use it in our seminars, and I should explain that one of the, the, the story of how we use it is kind of interesting. When I started teaching our management seminars, um, I really had the feeling that I had a tremendous bias in favor of everybody who came to the seminar. So what they told me, I wanted to believe if they told me that they had a boss who was problematic or an employee who was hard to manage, um, I thought, well, they must be right. But the reporter in me started to wonder if there wasn't more to the story, that my bias, because I was in the presence of somebody, was getting in the way of my ability to really help them because I couldn't see the contextual picture. picture. So I, I proposed to point out that we start doing our own version of 360 feedback. These are not numeric grades, and they are not anonymous, which is often the case in, in organizations, especially for CEOs, because people are afraid to speak truth to power. But we decided that because journalists believe in sourcing and because we were going to do these right, we would have them be narrative. And there would be about five or six questions that essentially said when it comes to leadership and management, what does Bob do well? When it comes to the journalism, editing or photo editing or ethical decision making, all of those things, what do they do well? Or tell me about their skills in this area. What about their skills in the interpersonal arena from and we just say generally, for example, coaching, feedback, uh, change management. What about organizationally, scheduling, distri distribution of work? Tell us about how they handle that. And then our last question is, hey, nobody's perfect. What, is, what could this person do to be even more effective? But we always start with what do they do well? Everybody knows that the person's going to read it. The person knows who's sending it. And what's interesting is, in the dozen years that I've been doing this, I have had no problems with it. People have thought, oh, well, they pull their punches. They're very candid. They're probably, uh, they're probably diplomatic, but they're still candid. And people who've come to our seminars have these amazing eye-opening experiences, especially about what they're given credit for that they didn't know. And I literally force people to use a highlighting pen. I, I ask them to take the pointer highlighter pledge and I solemnly promise to highlight the good stuff, not just the stuff that says I suck. And because that good stuff is your juice. It's the social capital that you have that you'll now take for granted because you're only going to focus on the things that somebody says you could do better. But this is the place where people find out that they've got bad habits, that they try to multitask and type on the computer while somebody's talking to them and don't give them their full attention, or that they interrupt or that they kill good ideas before they really have a chance to start. They learn all of those things, or that they're a fixer instead of a coach. They learn all of those things in a safe place, and it makes them very interested in getting the training that comes in the rest of the week. In organization, now, the interesting thing is, these belong to the people who come to our seminars. They don't go in the personnel file, they don't, their bosses don't get a copy, and so, and, in, and when I cite some of them in the book, I am very careful to point out that neither um, generous bribes nor enhanced interrogation methods would get me to identify <laughs> who sent them or who right, received them. Right, I saw that. But, but what happens in organizations is that these, if they're misused, they're letter bombs, okay? Um, they're time consuming, they're not taken seriously, they're not tied to any kind of training, and they become letter bombs. I can critique you, you can critique me, and in a worst case scenario, it goes into my personnel file and all it is is used as like this little ticking time bomb against me. But we, when, I, when, they're, when they work well, they are a free peek at reality. A chance for you to see what people are actually saying and feeling, but they're just not saying it to you. So you're given a safe way to do it, but then you're also given some training afterwards, some, and also some translation. So that if three people say that you're a great coach and one person says that you're an inveterate fixer, well, maybe it's because that fixer person needs, needs to have his or her work so radically adjusted that you've given up trying to coach. And then it becomes, how do I help you help that person, either to manage them up or to recognize that they're not going to perform to the standard that you need. Is it, is it unusual in a feedback review situation that uh, two or three people uh, who report to the same person have 
entirely opposite views of that person? Is it just a personality situation? Or, or how, how, I guess what I'm wondering is how does the person receiving all that feedback kind of balance it out and, and come to some you know, objective conclusions about what's right and what's wrong? This is one of the reasons why I am so strong about having our feedback be non-anonymous in the programs that I do. I have done it in organizations where they decided that the culture of their organization was such that people might not be candid or they'd be fearful if they couldn't be anonymous. But I like, whenever possible, to have them be signed so that these are the beginning of a conversation and you know the context. Otherwise, you get this evaluation that says... 75% 75% of the, you know, you get a 75% grade on coaching, but you don't know that other 25% who didn't rate you highly, um, was that the class president or the class clown, you know, that just <laughs> did that? Or was that evaluation of you just circulated right after you were told by management that you had to walk around telling people there is no more overtime and by the way, um, we are going to ask you to pay more for your health insurance. And then the next day, this goes out and you're being evaluated in some way by it. So to go back to, yes, there are differences. And frequently it is because the manager very courageously asked a person with whom he or she already has some pre-existing tension for feedback. And they were courageous enough to see what that person would say. That may explain it so that we can then de- you know, probe what the tension may be. Or the other thing that we always do is probe personality differences. So I always follow our feedback sessions with a Myers-Briggs type indicator so that if you think that you're a very friendly person and you're outgoing and a lot of other people say you are friendly and outgoing and somebody else says you're overly talkative and you're getting in your own way with that person because of it, we may find out through looking a little deeper that that person prefers introversion. And for that person, being interrupted as often as you do in the most friendly of of manner is an impediment to his or her work. It's not, they're not saying you're a bad person and you'll learn to manage that person a little differently. Hmm. All right, I've got just a couple more uh, questions, uh, but let's call them kind of short ones. Uh, I don't want to keep you too long here. But what are some of the things that employees never forget about the boss? <laughs> they never forget how you handled a mistake. They never forget where you were at one of their most joyful and one of their saddest times. To me, those are probably the two of the biggest that people don't forget. They'll tell, they tell stories to this day about the time that their mother was, was very ill and the boss said, go, take care of your family. We'll miss you, but we'll get along just fine. And they meant it. And what about the things that employees never forgive about their bosses? Those are those trust busters. That's the, that's the you take credit for my work. That's the you fail to take blame. You know, I always tell bosses that um, shining a spotlight on your employees is a terrific thing. It's a great way of managing up. When somebody does something well, if you think about this spotlight, you know, it doesn't have to be on you. If you shine it over here on this person, you're kind of in the edge of it. It's almost inescapable. Your bosses, when you call attention to your employees' good work, it's pretty obvious that the person who told them, the messenger, deserves some credit for that as well. Many times bosses don't understand the importance of managing up on behalf of their team. I didn't. When I was a baby manager, I went to a news director's conference, and I remember the speakers in the management session saying, the most important thing you do is go face-to-face with the general manager once a day. And I said, (laughs) I've got a newsroom to run. I've got people. I've got stories. I've got... And, And then he said, and if you think you're too busy, just remember, somebody else is in there. It could be someone from the sales department asking for resources. It could be one of your viewers calling in with a complaint. It could be the promotions department talking about what they want to do in a way that you haven't had a voice in. You're too busy keeping your head down in your work to go and manage the relationship and the information with your boss. You aren't serving your team well. So there's a difference between managing up and sucking up. (laughs) Very well said. And uh, 
maybe we will wind up with this uh, as simply as possible. What is the difference? Because you deal with both of these. What is the difference between a manager and a leader? You know, there are dissertations written about it, so I've made it really short. It's simply this. People are required to follow a manager. It's written in their job descriptions. They choose to follow a leader, and leaders can live in any level of an organization. Hmm. Very good. Nice and succinctly put. So uh, as we're talking, the book is officially a few days from coming out, although it does, it, the, the physical copies have snuck out and people will be able to get it on uh, on their Kindle, yep, uh, on their Kindle and, and things like that. Uh, what's next? More podcasts, more columns? Will there be another book? Ooh, um, you, you're talking, I still feel like the woman who's just finished labor and you're <laughs> asking about the next baby. Um, but this was a wonder, this was a labor of love. I loved writing it. Um, I think I'd, I want to see what the feedback is and what people are asking for because I wrote the book in response to people saying to me, could you give me just one book? And I don't know if you can see behind me, but I've got lots of books on my shelves. Mm -hmm. But I would always have to say, what one skill do you want to get better at? Because most books are narrowly focused on change management or coaching or emotional intelligence. And they'd say, no, no, the stuff that you're teaching, you know, isn't there like in that in one book? And, and I'm certain that maybe I've missed, that it's got to be out there and I've missed it, but I hadn't seen anything in a contemporary vein that pulled recent research together. And so I undertook to write it. And my hope is that... Um, managers as teams if they don't get training and so many people don't get training today they may not be able to have me come to their workplace or send somebody to pointer um, but that they'll use this as a team training device and and frankly I will tell you that pointer is hopeful that this will help us expand the training that we do and we will teach people in addition to journalists and then use those resources that it provides us to continue our mission to support strong and professional journalism in a democracy. My, my suspicion, uh, and, and you just hit on it, was that this would, this would be a tool, uh, whether intended or not, and I think it'll work, to take the, your, your message and your uh, tools and, and style of doing this to a much broader uh, audience. Uh, I'm sure the podcast, uh, the, when it was just a column, it was mostly news media oriented. The podcast certainly broke it out to a much broader audience. And the book, the, there'll be people who will, who will buy the book and will uh, appreciate the book and who won't even know that you had this news uh, connection. So, yeah, That's what we really tried to do, just as in the podcast. It was a strategic decision on our part. And on the podcast, we've had 8 million downloads since 2010 when we started them. And I hear from all around the world and I hear from people in professions ranging from the clergy to the military to hospitals to insurance companies to IT. I mean, it's, it is amazing. The lessons translate everywhere. Very good. Well, um, folks, listen, you can, uh, you can find Jill Geisler's new book, Work Happy, What Great Bosses Know, uh, in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price right here at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. And, of course, you can find her podcast, What Great Bosses Know, uh, at Pointer Online, which is pointer.org, or on iTunes U, iTunes University. Uh, do you want to... Uh, tell folks about a particular website you want to send them to? Well, we have, um, I have a, a Facebook page for the book, which is a great way to hear from people right away. So if you just look up Work Happy on Facebook, you can go there. And then I also have a website for the book, which is whatgreatbossesknow.com. Or you can do jillgeisler.com, and that'll find it as well. And look for her on Pointer. Dot, dot org as well. Right. Uh, Jill, a lot of fun having you today. Thanks so much for joining us, Mr. Media, and good luck with the book. Thank you, Bob. My pleasure. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. 
Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, BlackBerry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.